Hello everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a great day, and if not, I hope it gets better for you soon. This is Fishery, and I'm your host, which makes me him, so let's jump right in and talk about plant fertilizers for your aquarium. So, there's lots of options out there. There's everything from root tabs that you can buy and put in your substrate or soil, or your gravel or sand, and there's all sorts of different sands and soils you can use if your plants have roots. If they're plants that don't have roots that are called epiphytic or rhizome plants or floating plants, they may be able to eat straight from the water column. And those plants may need something like a liquid additive. And when it comes to liquid additives or nutrients or fertilizers, there's a lot of options out there. So which is best for the kind of tank you have? Well, that's what we're going to go over today, and we're going to cover some of the basics of how plants use these things so that hopefully, even if you have a situation a little different than the exact ones we describe or show, you'll be able to figure out what you need for your tank. And that's why it's a little bit longer of an explanation than it would be if I just told you what works best for me, because there's going to be different best solutions or best fertilizers for different situations and tanks. Not to mention every plant out there and every fish, animal, creature evolved differently. And maybe in one habitat, a plant evolved to need a whole bunch of, say, iron as a nutrient. And in another location, they don't need it at all. But in the aquarium, we have put together organisms from all over the world, including plants from all over the world. And so what we need to do is broadly try to give them every nutrients that they could possibly need. And that's what fertilizers are all about. So we've got the liquid all-in-ones, which are kind of the best attempt to get most of the things in one thing you can add as a liquid or as a powder that you mix into water and then add to your tank. Or people who are doing really high-end aquascaping and growing of plants or nurseries and things, they may actually try to target a specific set of those important nutrients and fertilizer components and only dose those and then so that they don't build up because everything you put into your little glass box is going to stay in your little glass box unless it evaporates out or spills out uh, until you do a water change. So a lot, some people will use fertilizers that are specific to the element and they'll add those elements in the amounts that they want for the plants they're growing and that's some pretty deep level fertilizing and that may be the best possible for those plants and how some people grow those incredible, you know, poster worthy aquascapes of bright colors and the Dutch gardens of underwater plants where you don't really even see fish living with them. But in most cases, most of you are probably keeping fish. And so if you're keeping fish and shrimp, we run into another problem. And that is that the way your plants eat is different than the way your fish and shrimp eat. And our plants prefer to eat, for instance, nitrogen in the form of ammonia. Whereas ammonia will kill or poison fish and shrimp and snails and even different microbes at very low levels that our plants actually need them at. So we need to feed our plants differently or in a different strategy than we feed our creatures those nutrients. However, since, like I said, everything stays in the aquarium, there's another method out there that doesn't involve necessarily root tabs and aqua soils and adding certain nutrients later on but there's methods where people try to build in the fertilizers into their soil or into their substrate and they're using substrates that actually have nutrients whereas gravel and sand or fluorite or marbles none of that stuff's going to have anything your plants need the only way those types of substrates and tank bottoms are going to have what your plants need is if your fish and other plants and things break down and the food you feed your fish break down over time and create a nutrient dense layer of what we call mulm. 
M-U-L-M, mulm. And mulm can have all the nutrients of whatever you're feeding your creatures. Now, if you're gravel vacuuming and doing water changes, the gravel vacuuming of all that brown, fluffy debris that's basically fish waste and plant debris and excess food, your mulm, you're pulling out of the tank. So your plants won't be using it. And so if you have a substrate like sand, for instance, or gravel, then it's not going to have any nutrients ever if you're gravel vacuuming. So that's why it's important to also understand that when you gravel vacuum and do water changes, you're actually removing those nutrients that may be floating in the water, dissolved, or that may be at the bottom of the tank. And it's up to you. Do you want a tank that has a natural system, uh, an ecological food web, where that debris settles over time as bacteria breaks it down? You feed your fish a quality food that's going to have things like potassium and calcium and iron and live creatures that have a balanced nutrient profile. Just inherently, because they're alive, they needed all those trace things. So clearly they got them in order to survive and grow. So when you feed your fish live food or quality whole foods like that, your fish waste is then full of a lot more nutrients. You can also buy, though foods that are enriched with some of those vitamins and nutrients and not only will that help your fish's health it will then get pooped out and the waste that it does become and that bacteria in your tank breaks it down into that light fluffy mulm that will eventually settle into banded layers in your substrate that becomes your plant food and even better which we don't have time to go into today but if you have a deep layered substrate or you have an aqua soil or dirt or earth from outside and then you have sand or something like that over it or very fine rocks in several inches over it, eventually that layer of mulm will become so fine and compressed and compacted by water and time and physics of Brownian motion, but we don't have time to get into that either today, that eventually it will settle into these bands that you see in old aquariums. And after six months to a year, the food you fed your fish, the plant leaves that have fallen off and uh, biodegraded or the botanicals you've added for your fish or your shrimp, like dried almond leaves and things like that, they all become food. So some people would rather not be adding all-in-one fertilizers and things like that, and they'd rather simply allow this natural process to unfold. But we're going to leave that natural process somewhat out of it today because it's very complex. But look up deep substrate or anoxic filtration, and I've done a whole lot of videos on that, as have many other people. You can search in the YouTube search tab, just hit the at symbol, and then type in fishery, my channel, and then whatever subject, whether it's sand caps or deep substrate or nutrients or whatever you want to know. I've got like 1,300 videos on it, and if I don't have it, I'm sure someone else's video will pop up about it. Also, you can always leave a comment. I love hearing from you guys, and I love hearing what's working best for you in your system. Okay, so let's start off with the idea that in your aquarium, your plants need to use nutrients in a certain way. And somebody way smarter than me figured out that there's something called the law of limiting resources or law of limiting nutrition in plants. And it's the idea that your plants need certain things, just like we need certain vitamins and minerals and food and air and water. Your plants need things too. So for their energy, they're getting it from the sun. So of course they're going to need sun and they're going to need water. But then they have a group of nutrients called micronutrients that includes everything all the way down to, you know, silver, platinum, gold, very, very small amounts of elements that you may only need a few molecules of for a very specific function in only a few cells of certain plants. And those are your micronutrients on the very small side, but then some of your micronutrients are more important. And some of those nutrients include things like zinc or iron. And I'm sure you can imagine where the, 
the the soil and the earth in some lakes and rivers has far more iron than in other places. So in some places, plants have evolved to use that and to require that in higher amounts than others. So when we dose our plants, we basically try to overdose them with anything they could need because due to the law of limiting factors, they only will use what they need, but all it takes is one limiting factor. So out of the other nutrients, the biggest, most important four that they need, which are called their macronutrients, they can be missing either potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, or carbon. And if they're missing any one of those things, or light, you know, or water, obviously, those are the other ones that are just kind of not listed. But if they're missing any one of those things or have too little of it, it doesn't matter if they have everything else they need to flourish perfectly, they won't grow right. They will grow poorly and or die. And so what we do is we overdose all those nutrients to make sure that everything a plant could need is in our tank. And we dose both in the substrate where roots end up. So if you have stem plants and plants like crypts or sword plants where they have roots that are down in the substrate that are feeding that way, that's how nine times more nutrients are absorbed in your average aquatic plant than from the water column. Now, above the earth, it's even more insane than that, and that's why there's so few species of plants that live in the air, like tillandsias or air plants, because they can't just steal the nitrogen they need out of the atmosphere, even though it's 70% nitrogen. They actually have to have microbes and bacteria and or fungi share it with their roots and that's what we end up eating in the form of plants and nutrition or animals that ate plants to get our nitrogen that we need as humans so basically with these fertilizers we're trying to give them everything they need the only problem is plants prefer to eat things a little differently than fish do and the amount that we could give a plant to grow ideally is enough to actually make our fish and our shrimp and snails sick. So they would prefer oftentimes to feed off of ammonia on their roots and their root system deep in the substrate, but up in the water column, if there was enough ammonia that you could feed them at their best, it would be poisoning your fish. So we have to limit the things that are there or we have to do things like water changes and remove things because our little glass box is not as big as the world outside. So whatever we put in is going to stay there. Now you have the option of doing gravel vacuuming and cleaning up the mulm and debris at the bottom that will turn into nutrients eventually. And it can turn an inactive substrate into one that's full of nutrients over time and that your plants actually will feed off after six months to a year of it building up, even though it may not look so great at first. Or you can keep it clean and pristine and have a very shallow substrate, like something like marbles or glass beads, rocks, sand, whatever you want. You can have a shallow substrate and you can gravel vac and constantly clean up that waste so that it's not dissolving into the water because we have to rely on the bacteria in the nitrogen cycle to break down that ammonia into nitrites and then into nitrates. And the nitrates are what we're deciding to feed to our plants. Now, even though they'd rather eat the ammonia, they'd rather eat the nitrogen in, in the form of ammonia or ammonium, they are settling basically with eating it as nitrates in the water column. So that's why root tabs that have ammonia or aqua soil that cost more money, those little round pellets, rather than something like soil or dirt or fertilizer from the store for terrestrial plants, those were specifically designed for our aquatic plants. And the center of those has a completely different process at each little pellet that stores ammonia and all the other nutrients the plants need, but keeps it out of the water column, while the outside of the pellet has good bacteria that's turning ammonia floating in the water from our fish going to the bathroom or from food uh, breaking down, which also turns into ammonia, and it's converting it into nitrites with one set of bacteria, and then another species of bacteria turns it into nitrates. 
And so basically most fertilizers you buy that are liquid fertilizers, they're not going to have ammonia in them. Now, if it was just plants and we weren't worried about the fish and the health of our other creatures, we could just feed them like we do hydroponically, and you could add something like ammonia to a mixture in a low concentration constantly to grow your plants even faster. However, because we're limited by this, we use in our fertilizers and all-in-one fertilizer things like aquarium co-op or plant juice from Dustin's Planted Tanks or Seachem Flourish, Brightwell products, ADA products. We use what's safe for the fish. And if you dose it as indicated, it shouldn't ever build up to a level that's unsafe for the fish. And that's me that means that if you're using a product that goes into the water column and doesn't settle out, so a product that's liquefied like that and doesn't settle out back into the substrate, you're going to need to do water changes or you're going to need plants that actually utilize every component in there before it gets to a dangerous level for your critters. So that means if you're using a liquid fertilizer, you basically need to also be doing the water changes most likely. Once you get really into this, there's exceptions and things like that, but essentially you can decide to have a substrate or basically the, the dirt in the bottom of your aquarium. You can buy aqua soils that are built in with all sorts of nutrients and those are a fertilizer that you start with in your tank and that you can plan on having. And those will feed your plants through the roots. Or you can feed them in the water column. Or you can do both. So if you have some plants that are floating at the top of the water, some that are on, you know, tied to sticks, some that are growing on rocks, those are called epiphytic plants. And they are usually evolved to feed using much less nutrients and as long as they have proper lighting, they will be able to survive off of what's in the water, provided that at least you have a whole lot of fish making a whole lot of waste, like in nature there's a lot of waste, and that you have your tank cycled and all of that. But that's why we do water changes, so that none of those levels build up too high. Now, if you've got the floating plants and the, the plants like Anubias, like Java Fern, and root plants and stem plants, that's where you might want to use root tabs, which are basically just a solid or powdered form pressed together like a pill of the liquid fertilizers. And they are just inserted down a few inches into the substrate. And ideally, you either have sand or something fine-grained as substrate on the very top layer so that as that dissolves or breaks down and the plant roots eat it and wrap around it and absorb it, it doesn't break apart and dissolve up into the water and release anything negative to impact your fish or shrimp. Because plants like things like copper and iron in amounts that may be not so good or could even be deadly, for instance, to shrimp. So you have a lot of different options. You can also do the estimative index dosing, which is when you know what all your plants need, you know what all plants you have, and you're dosing those in one element at a time, and you understand all that science. So I'm going to leave that out today, other than just describing it that much. But it involves doing a water change either weekly or daily or a couple times a week and resetting your baseline and knowing you have basically pure water and then you add the nutrients to the level that you have wanted or that you're aiming for every few days and you reset that process over and over. So that is the estimative index. Now other people sometimes will put in some root tabs, they'll use the aqua soil which has all sorts of nutrients and things and they'll feed their fish those holistic foods that will later turn into mulm and settle down into the soil and keep recharging that soil for your plants. But remember, if you don't have good lighting or you don't have enough of one nutrient, it doesn't matter what you do. It's not going to be a healthy plant. So when people ask me, should I use CO2 as a fertilizer? The answer is only yes if you have already medium or high light and all the different liquid fertilizers and different fertilizers that are under the substrate or your substrate itself. 
So, I hope this clears up some of the different ways you can do this. You can holistically wait for the mulm and things to build up and become enriched by your fish and the water column will be enriched. And instead of doing water changes, you'll be trimming plants that are actually grown from the waste materials that are in your fish and later passed out. And then your shrimp and your snails use some of it and then bacteria and fungi use some more of it. But there's still going to be nutrients there after all of that. And fish miss some food too. So by using quality products and by planting your tank like an ecosystem, you can do that. Or you can use whatever substrate you want in a shallow amount and you can clean your tank with a gravel vac. And you can use root tabs for your plants that have roots. And you can use liquid fertilizer like an all-in-one for your plants that don't have roots as well as it will help supplementally feed your plants with roots because they still feed a little bit from the water and it'll also help your floating plants obviously but it's really important to have light and then if you really want to kick everything up a notch you can add that pressurized co2 which will basically act like steroids and improve everything you've already got going and help your plants grow that much more so I hope this kind of de, uh, demystifies some of these things. There's lots of brands out there and people have all different opinions about which brand or which method of doing things is right. But I just wanted to explain how they work and how they interact with plants on a scientific level so you'll have the information to make the choice that's best for you. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fishery. I want to thank you all. Uh, members, thank you an extra amount. If you want to become a member, there's 200 extra audio episodes of the podcast that you get for free and you get behind the scenes looks. But just watching, just being here, making it this far and or sharing this with someone who could use it or find it interesting means so much to me and I want to thank you all. So have a great day and I will see you all on the next episode of Fishery.